Evolution is a term to define only one organism, and that's the self. The self is the universe, the self is the alpha and omega, God and infinity. And that's the only thing that evolves, because we are all part of the self. Nothing goes through an evolutionary process alone, or without direct benefit to the whole. So when you begin to think that there's this controlling elite, this controlling hand behind the curtains leading the planet to destruction, when you think the end is near, the apocalypse, Armageddon, and when you think we as a species are doomed, it is not they, it is you that brought this about. And for a very good reason. You are evolving. Stop blaming everybody and everything else. Quit panicking about global tyranny and natural disaster and pay attention. Because the world is telling you something, is telling you exactly what is wrong with you and how to fix it. The Earth is believed to have formed 4.6 billion years ago. Within the first 150 million years, it began cooling and releasing gases from the lithosphere, which created the earliest forms of the Earth's atmosphere. Prior to the creation of this atmosphere, the Sun's ultraviolet radiation made for uninhabitable conditions. But as the Earth cooled further, water condensed in the atmosphere and oxygen accumulated, making way for organic compounds. This spawned single-celled organisms, and then plant life. And down through time, the evolutionary chain continued. And then we arrive at a species that does not seem to fit as well as the rest. Homo sapiens' gestation period of nine months mimics the 3.8 billion year evolution of all life on Earth the human embryo repeats the evolution of all species. When the sperm and egg unite, this new creation is a single-celled organism. Within hours, this single cell divides and multiplies more rapidly than any other species. Four weeks later, the embryo begins to develop gills mimicking aquatic life. A few weeks later, it develops lungs and a tail with reptilian appearance. From there, a mammal is recognizable and then onto a primate form. It then sheds its laguna, which is the embryonic fur, and at last, shows the characteristics of a human child. The human body is a community of approximately 50 trillion cells. Everything the body does, the cell does as well. Cells have respiratory and excretory systems. They feed, feel, think, and communicate with other cells. Trillions of cells make up a single organism called the human body, and billions of human bodies help make up the organism we call Earth. The Earth has more similarities with the human anatomy than you may think. Earth has its own electromagnetic generation, just like the human body. Research has found that a direct current of electricity flows through perineural cells found around every nerve in the body. These pathways are called energy meridians and have been used in the practice of acupuncture for at least 2,000 years. Dating even farther back is the notion of dragon paths or ley lines in which many megalithic structures and stone monuments were erected, marking the energy meridians of the earth. These energy meridians are generated by the resonant frequencies of the earth, 
called the Schumann waves. Each planetary body has its own resonant frequencies and is determined by the circumference and diameter as well as the speed of orbit and rotation. The Earth's resonant frequency starts at 7.83 Hz and ends with the seventh harmonic at 43.2 Hz, correlating with the seven chakras. Ultimately, the greatest discovery of our Earth is its consciousness. A visible attribute of consciousness is an energetic field that governs the shaping of organisms. Morphogenesis is a scientific term to explain this very shaping of tissues, organs, and entire organisms. Consciousness is the creative force of the entire universe. It has been given many names such as God, Yahweh, Krishna, nature, the field, and divinity. The entire universe is in fact a single living conscious organism with complete awareness of itself. The reason why it may seem difficult to comprehend this is because our understanding is typically limited by our language. When we hear the term conscious organism, we tend to anthropomorphize its definition. By giving it human qualities, we mistakenly look past what an organism truly is in the first place. The definition of an organism is any living thing capable of response to stimuli, reproduction, growth and development, and maintenance of homeostasis as a stable whole. Our universe does all of these things. The consciousness of our universe is responsible for the form and purpose that all matter assumes. The Earth's resonant frequencies are a result of its form. These frequencies are responsible for biological rhythms such as menstrual and circadian cycles as well as behavioral and emotional patterns. The frequencies are then picked up by the flora and fauna which are biological instruments that respond to the wave patterns. The wave patterns resonate in the cranial structure of our head and converge in the center of our brain which is where we find the pineal gland. The pineal gland is believed in many cultures to be the spiritual third eye responsible for intuition. Descartes called it the seat of the soul where mind and body meet. Each individual cell in our body receives an electromagnetic impulse from our central nervous system. They receive the very same impulse that was disseminated to every biological instrument from the earth. An explanation of our conscious universe has been attempted by religion, science and philosophy. The neglect of biological nature from any organism causes illness. A divorce from nature, exile from Eden, confounding of tongues, they are all symptoms not of a biblical God or deity, but the true self. The greatest and only threat to ourselves is a loss of self, the death of our divinity. As we barrel through history with oceans of information, yet barely a drop of wisdom, we have to understand how we lost ourself. In sacred texts and ancient scriptures left by our ancestors, we find an incredible link between stories of creation, a great flood, the war of the gods, the Messiah dying for the sins of man, end time prophecies, and similar characters. These correlations show up in myths from cultures that supposedly had no contact with one another due to distance in geography and time. The common thread we find that connects all of mythology has its roots in the stars. One of the most revealing accounts is the battle of the gods in heaven and the ensuing flood. In the Bible, Lucifer rivaled the Lord and was defeated and cast down to earth. In the creation myth of the Enuma Elish, we find a similar story of Tiamat being defeated by Marduk and cast down to the abyss of Absu. In chaos, Tiamat, the mother of them both, Absu and Tiamat's waters were mingled together meaning that the chaotic waters of Tiamat were somehow mixed with the sweet waters of Apsu. Apsu was the Sumero Akkadian god of the abyss beneath the earth. Tiamat, also known as Lucifer, was known as a serpent or dragon and was defeated by Marduk. Marduk was the father of Nebo or Mercury. And Mercury is the same mythological character as the Zoroastrian Mithra, the Egyptian Hermes Anubis, and the Gnostic Hermes Christos. The most recent version of Mercury, however, 
is the Archangel Michael in the Bible, who defeated Lucifer and sent him to the abyss of the earth, or hell. This story is steeped in astrological significance in the Bible and in many other ancient scriptures. This leads to an event in history that is recorded by many researchers regarding the cosmic upheaval and historic deluge. William Commonus Beaumont states, The flood immortalizes the collision of a fallen planet, later termed Satan, actually a cometary body with our Earth. Consider what this reveals. He postulates that a planet, later termed Satan, fell to the earth creating the flood we see recorded in the Bible and other myths. Lucifer, or Tiamat, was a planet known to ancient cultures as the Glistening One, the dragon of chaotic salt waters. The light from the sun illuminated this planet's water which gave it a glow that rivaled the sun's own light, which is where we hear about Lucifer rivaling the Lord. The Lord in this case being the sun, which sustains and gives warmth to the earth. The planet Tiamat or Lucifer was destroyed by a cataclysmic event that hurled the watery planet to the abyss of the earth. In the book of Enoch, it reveals, And behold, a star fell from heaven, and when it fell to earth, I saw how the earth was swallowed up in a great abyss. The myth of the Ute Indian states, the sun was shivered into a thousand fragments, which fell to earth causing a general conflagration. Then, Tawats fled before the destruction he had wrought. And as he fled, the burning earth consumed his feet, legs, body, hands, and arms, until at last, swollen with heat, the eyes of the god burst and tears gushed forth in a flood which spread over the earth, extinguishing the fire. This myth resembles the translation of the Enuma Elish by Stephanie Daly in her book, Myth from Mesopotamia, which explains that Tiamat's eyes became the source of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. As written in the book of Revelations, and there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth. The Roman mythology of Ovid gives the story of Phaeton, which happens to be another name given to the watery planet Lucifer or Tiamat. This story reveals that Phaeton was a child of the sun and wished to become the sun for a day. Phaeton attempted this feat and eventually, Jove, who is also known as Marduk, destroyed Phaeton sending him crashing to the earth in flames and put out by a tremendous flood of water from a river unseen before. The common theme we notice here is that of a saltwater planet, the great dragon, Lucifer, Tiamat, or Phaeton, was defeated and fell to the earth, and now dwells in the abyss known as Hell, giving us the outline of the story of Lucifer rising up against the Lord and being defeated and banished to rule the underworld. As we know, however, an outline is but a shell of a story. The inner meaning, the spirit of the myth comes with a deeper understanding of the essence of each planet, not just the physical planet, but the conscious core, because we know now that the proportions and velocity of a planet gives them their own characteristic frequencies which govern biological and behavioral patterns. These planets reflect the archetypal psychology of man. In ancient times, Probably the most important field of research was the study of the heavens. Galactic bodies and their movement through the sky were known to be symbolic of the inner faculties within human consciousness. Within all organisms, outdated science has only explained the physical world measured by our five senses. Only in esoteric religions, mysticism, and quantum fields of science are we to find any attempt at explaining where thoughts and emotions fit into the sense-perceptible world. We also understand now that humanity is a community of cells within the organism of the Earth. The Earth, therefore, is a higher organism that shapes our form and function. This higher organism and all other planetary bodies are governed by consciousness, just as we individual humans are. Therefore, the Newtonian belief that galactic bodies are nothing more than lifeless forms floating in space 
is tantamount to claiming that we humans are nothing more than a composite of elements in motion. We know that this is untrue because we feel, we think, and furthermore we see the result of our consciousness creating what we call life. Plato wrote, This world is indeed a living being, endowed with a soul and intelligence, a single visible living entity containing all other living entities, which by their nature are all related. Furthermore, the cosmos is a single living creature which contains all living creatures within it. And in an article out of the Sufi journal, the author writes, The world is a living spiritual being. This was understood by the ancient philosophers and the alchemists who referred to the spiritual essence of the world as the anima mundi, the soul of the world. In scriptures, we hear of the claim that angels guide the inner soulful actions of people or that the gods wield influence over man. Most ancient spiritual and scientific teachings held the belief that the hierarchies of the gods, angels, archangels, archai, all the way down to the cherubim and the seraphim are the hierarchies within the human psyche. In this way, we must understand that when the whole of ancient myths and sacred scriptures speak of spiritual influence from a higher being, they were speaking of archetypal forces that are inherent within us, not an influence from an external source. This is where we begin to see the relevance of astrology as an ancient form of science that resurfaced in the 19th and 20th centuries under the name of psychology. Frederick Nietzsche even stated, as long as you still experience the stars as something above you, you still lack a viewpoint of knowledge. This is astro-psychology and maps the inner faculties of the psyche. In pre-Christian times, there were schools known today as the mystery schools or the mystery religions. The messages encoded in the scriptures and ancient archaeology came from adepts of spiritual science. The intent was to teach the initiates the deeper meaning of these myths. What became later termed as Lucifer, Satan, or the Devil was representative of the ego which rivals the Lord, the representative of the self. The true self is the epicenter of a person's entire being. It is the total sum of everything that we are. The false ego, on the other hand, is the idea and concept we create about ourselves in the course of our lives, which typically excludes any qualities we don't wish to accept about ourselves. However, humanity has been endowed with the freedom to choose either to obey the true self or to give in to the temptation of the vanity and materialism of the false ego. This is the most notable trait that separates man from animal. Our freedom of choice. The choice to follow our concepts and ideals or our natural impulses. The choice to sustain nature or to destroy it. This freedom of choice weighs on the fate of the entire organism that we call humanity. Cancer begins with a group of cells within a community that fail to communicate with the conscious signal of the organism. Those cells begin to grow out of control and spread to other areas of the organism. This very disease is evident in our world today. The cancer upon our earth is the domination of our false ego and our divorce from nature. Collectively, among every human, vanity leads to segregation and competition. Competition leads to fear and greed. Greed leads to deceit and immorality. And immorality is the breeding ground for illness waging war on our earth. Every act of hatred and destructiveness in our world begins with self-hate and self-destructiveness. And that all begins with a breakdown in communication. In nature, all that we perceive with our five senses is a result of two fundamental principles. Everything in existence is made of a relationship between vibration and matter. Vibration is a masculine creative force countered by matter, which is a feminine receptive force. 
Thus begins the principle of duality. We see this duality in ancient myths and philosophies, yet only those philosophies and scriptures that were perverted and raped of the original meaning gave the impression that one polarity was good while the other was evil. The original sages, adepts and shamans taught that both are necessary and one would not exist without the other. These two important principles come together to form all things in the universe. This is Kaimatica. Even language, logos, the communication of any and all things in nature depends upon this principle. Pete Peterson in his works Cymatics, The Science of the Future stated that nature shows examples of Kaimatica in everything. This phenomena is found to be one of the prime forces that moves biological evolution along its path. Dan Winter reproduced an experiment to prove that the ancient languages of Hebrew and Sanskrit, when spoken, create a vibratory frequency that moved matter into sacred geometrical patterns. Upon further investigation, Hebrew, Sanskrit, Aramaic, Arabic, and other elder dialects have older roots in apparent language of Gaelic and quite possibly an even earlier origin. In Swami Murugesu's The Science of Mantra, he claimed that when a person chanted specific words in Sanskrit while filming a burning candle, the intensity as well as the color of the flame would change due to the frequency that the word would emit. This same science has been shown to lower and raise blood pressure. And in his own words, certain sounds can affect their circulation and nervous system. Whatever change such vibrations cause extends to the mind of a person and also to the surrounding atmosphere causing warmth or coolness. All this can be known by study and shown by practice. This rediscovered knowledge of the science of sound shows that sound is something more than mere vibratory signals. Not only does sound interact with life, but it sustains and develops it. It acts as a conduit of conscious intent between people, societies, and entire civilizations. Yet the psychic illness we endure due to the domination of our false ego is reflected in the collective. Our psychological schism has shut us off from communicating correctly with our inner self, which is exactly how cancer cells within the body operate. In the collective, we have created a language barrier between humanity and the rest of nature, acting as a global cancer. Recorded in history, the efficacy of the ancient languages has been severely uprooted. The alphanumeric translation from Hebrew to English shows a complete reversal of the two languages, giving the cymatic effect unnatural results. Dr. Leonard Horowitz stated in his work on DNA, one third of the sensory motor cortex of the brain is devoted to the tongue, oral cavity, the lips, and speech. In other words, oral frequency emissions spoken or sung exert powerful control over life, vibrating genes that influence total well-being and even evolution of the species. A degradation of language in this case is shown to affect biology. If something as basic and important as language can be degraded and devalued to such a degree, yet never questioned, what else might we be missing? Think of an aspect of your life that dictates the limits of your freedom. Government and law enforcement, insurance and pharmaceutical companies, taxes, building permits, driver's licenses and more. There are hundreds if not thousands of stipulations, regulations and boundaries on our freedom. And out of the ones that were just mentioned, how many have you researched to find out whether they apply to you or not? Let's look at the forms of law that we currently acquiesce to. A common misconception among people is that any rule or regulation that governs them falls under one category, law. But there are many other forms of law that people abide by without realizing that they simply do not apply to them. Another misconception is that a nation's constitution gives us our rights. A constitution does nothing more than list the rights that we already have. We are born with inalienable rights, endowed to us by our Creator. They are not given to us and they cannot be given away. The most a person can do with a right is choose whether to exercise it or not. Maritime Admiralty Law is what's known as the Law of the Water. 
It is superseded by civil law and only applies to those who willingly contract themselves into it. The definition of admiralty law is a body of private international law governing the relationships between private entities which operate vessels on the oceans. Let's look at how and why a form of law that is fashioned to govern corporations, businesses, and vessels has imposed its rule over natural human beings. This is all done through a form of word magic. A simple perversion of language has made it possible to convince people around the world that these alternative laws apply to them. One of the predominant beliefs in modern culture is that licenses, permits, registrations, and other forms of documentation are required to operate motor vehicles, use public roads, build structures and establishments, engage in free enterprise, and much more. Sadly, these beliefs are based on little to no investigation whatsoever, and are false. This belief structure is perpetuated by maritime admiralty law. This form of law was originally created to govern ships docking in foreign nations for the import or export of products and resources. It deals with banking and merchant affairs, not civil affairs. When a product is taken off of a ship and brought into a foreign land, that nation takes custody of the resource and accounts for it with a certificate. That certificate marks the birth date of that product in the custody of the respective nation. Think of why it is supposedly required to have a certificate of live birth in the first place. The Barron's Dictionary of Banking Terms defines a certificate as a paper establishing an ownership claim. So right there, we notice that everyone with a birth certificate is defined as being owned. People are used as collateral with other nations because the U.S. is bankrupt. The United States declared bankruptcy on March 9th of 1933. At this point, the U.S. began taking out loans from a private, non-government affiliated corporation called the Federal Reserve. With no money to pay back the loans, the United States began using the citizens as collateral. All birth and marriage certificates are literally warehouse receipts. Just look at the similarities of warehouse receipts and birth certificates. Both document the date of issue, a serial number, registration number or receipt number, a description of the product, and an authorized informant to notify the appropriate government agency. With all of this information being readily available, the majority of people are unaware of their involvement with maritime admiralty law. This is possible through the manipulation of language. This admiralty law changed the meaning of the word person from a natural living person to a corporation. Driver's licenses, vehicle registrations, auto insurance forms, building permits, gun permits, work permits, tax filing documents, birth and death certificates, traffic citations, and many other forms of documentation that were once believed to be absolutely necessary only apply to persons or corporations. Upon signing such a legal document, you are indirectly waiving your rights under the Constitution and lowering your status to that of a corporation that is created with the same exact name as you. The only way to reconcile your true name from the name of the corporation is to take notice that the corporation has its name in all capital letters. This is known as Capitus Diminutia Maxima. You may take notice that your driver's license, birth certificate, social security card, insurance cards, and more use all capital letters to legally represent the corporation with your name, not you. The corporation is known as an artificial person, whereas you, the human being, are known as a natural person. This deception goes even deeper when it comes to the courts that we attend. When showing up to court, you will notice that there are seats for witnesses behind a wooden fence or barrier. The defendant must cross through the entrance to the other side of the barrier where the plaintiff and judge sit. This act symbolizes the boarding of a ship. At this time, business can be conducted in maritime admiralty law. The judge, acting as captain or banker, is responsible for settling the balance between the two sides. This is why there is always a monetary value involved in any court case. 
the captain is simply dealing with banking and merchant disputes. Once the balance is paid, the case is closed. To turn the court case away from admiralty law where your rights are not protected, you must avoid agreeing to represent the artificial person. This is done by stating that you are the natural person. You don't have a first or last name because those imply corporate title. In a court case, you may state that the court takes judicial notice of your honor's oath of office. Every judge must take an oath of office to practice law, yet you must make it clear to the court and the jury that the judge is acting as judge and not banker. Remember that you are a natural human being of the earth. You are not governed by anything but your own consciousness. Laws are created within a society. The society that created the laws we see being enforced today is called the Law Society. Yet the most beautiful part of this entire deception is the fact that we are not part of the Law Society, so their laws do not apply to us. Judges, lawyers, and law enforcement officers, they're all part of a society. Within that society, they've created their own language that's deceptively similar to English. They have these little things called statutes, acts, and regulations that seem like laws but they really only apply to those within their society. So that basically means all the traffic violations, minimum age requirements, and everything except for damage to another person or their property doesn't really apply to the natural person. Laws only apply to those within the law society. The game being played is an illusion. You can simply choose to open your eyes and reclaim the freedom that you were born with bound by nothing but the limits of your imagination. These are just a few examples of assuring that your rights are being protected. By far, the most important line of defense against this deception is to be aware of the perversion of language, and be absolutely aware of how you form your beliefs and concepts. In all forms of the perversion of language, there is a mirror reflection of this in the microcosm of the psyche. And the problem I see with humanity today is we don't truly know ourselves anymore. We have the 9 to 5 job, we have the house, the children, the bills, the television, the hobbies, and the errands that we run every single day, and we eventually begin to believe that this is who we are. You know, but who are we beneath the job title, beneath the status of mother or father, theist or atheist, Republican or Democrat, black or white, man or woman, who are we? Who are we deep down inside? We don't know because every time we hear an answer that we don't want to accept about ourselves, we deny it. We'll pass it off and project it onto somebody else and judge them for it. This is repression, and we see what repression is do to us on an individual level, but what about on a collective level of humanity? What happens when the whole world refuses to see what they truly are on the inside? Carl Jung discovered that there is a collective unconscious connected to all humans, meaning that the whole of humanity shares a single mind with one another. This is evident in the world through accounts of shared mythology and symbols, the study of morphic fields, and with the science of kinesiology. This collectivity is a global example of the unconscious mind of the human body in which trillions of cells share a similar signal. This parasite called our false ego requires a continuous flow of sustenance to survive. Food, fuel, and any other form of sustenance is energy. Human consciousness is an electromagnetic field of energy. 
When this potential energy is utilized, it then releases kinetic energy, which is used to perpetuate the false ego. This scenario occurs in the smallest parasitic organisms, all the way to a collective organism called humanity. A parasite will release chemicals that cause the host to crave the sustenance that the parasite needs to survive. As long as the host is unaware, it will keep feeding the parasite and starving itself. In a similar way, Wilhelm Reich stated that whole societies suffer from a psychosis caused by starving our organic biological impulses. He states that sexual suppression supports the power of the church, which has sunk very deep roots into the exploited masses by means of sexual anxiety and guilt. It engenders timidity towards authority and binds children to their parents. This results in adult subservience to state authority and to capitalistic exploitation. It paralyzes the intellectual critical powers of the oppressed masses because it consumes the greater part of biological energy. Finally, it paralyzes the resolute development of creative forces and renders impossible the achievement of all aspirations for human freedom. In this way, the prevailing economic system in which single individuals can easily rule entire masses becomes rooted in the psychic structures of the oppressed themselves. What Reich was showing in this powerful quote is that on a collective level, the suppression of a natural function, whether biological, spiritual, or emotional, will result in an abnormal reaction, a psychic disease. This illness or disease is reflected into the masses through a collective unconscious and acts as an epidemic. Humanity is plagued with an incapacity for freedom, meaning that people en masse lack the ability to govern themselves on a psychic level, and this manifests in the macrocosm as government and organized religious powers, thus opening the throne, our national and individual throne, to anyone and anything. Enter the infamous rulers of the earth, the patriarchs of civilization, political, social, economic, and spiritual dictatorship, psychic tyranny. This simple illness within our psyche, this lack of responsibility and neglect of basic human freedom, has made way for every tyrant that has ever held rule over people on this planet. But these oppressive tyrants that are demonized by the masses are no different than us. In fact, they are one with us. In the book The Prophet by Khalil Gibran, he poetically states, I say, as the holy and the righteous cannot rise beyond the highest which is in each of you, so the wicked and the weak cannot fall lower than the lowest which is in you also. Every one of us has the capability to commit the most horrifying sin or show the most beautiful compassion to our fellow man. This is the very definition of an illness within the psyche and soul of man. Think of any position of power that you believe to be above you royal families, government leaders, the United Nations, financial organizations, corporate monopolies and media juggernauts. These are all facets of our false ego. They are the physical advent of our own sickness. They require our conscious participation, our conscious energy to survive. Because without our cooperation, without supplying them with the sustenance of complicity, they starve. Their very nature depends on our desire to be ruled. And a typical symptom of the illness among humanity today is our continuous denial of our illness. Repression. We consistently repress those qualities we choose not to accept about ourselves. 
This is why it is so difficult to see the false ego and its multiple manifestations for what they truly are. This is the very nature of the false ego. It acts as a red herring to distract us from the freedom we truly have. For this psychic parasite to survive, it must supply us with a chemical that will cause us to remain dependent upon it. In this case, the sustenance is our conscious energy. And in order for us to feed it to the parasite, the chemical of fear causes humanity to crave protection and defense. The functions of the body to survive can be broken down to two basic functions for any organism to survive. You have to be able to grow, maintain yourself, take care of your biology, but you also must be able to protect yourself so that if you're just growing and you can't protect yourself, you'll become food for something else. So the uh, survival involves a balance between growth and protection. Through the history of human civilization and through a human evolution, we recognize that our nature is to be in a state of growth and that our protection is only supposed to be used to you know, help us out of that, that threatening moment. You can't be in growth and in protection at the same time. So the significance is when we see a need of protection, the stress hormones in the body shut off the blood vessels in our viscera or gut, which is the part of the body for growth. Well, the issue is if you took the blood from the viscera and moved it out to the arms, then you left no blood in the viscera. That means no growth, but you're ready to fight. And when your fighting is finished, then the blood returns back to the viscera and you grow again. But in the world that we live in today, it's 24 seven fear. So we have a continuous dripping of that stress hormone into the body. It's just dripping all the time, getting us ready to run or fight or flight at any moment at the drop of a hat. We're ready to go because we're on guard. Well, the problem is, what does that mean about your allocation of energy? And it says, we're spending most of our energy in protection. You cannot survive if you're in protection all the time. And if the parasite can control the nature of the fear, it can then create a fear among us that only it can defend us against. A recent physical manifestation of this comes from Zbigniew Brzezinski, former Secretary of State who also supported President Barack Obama. In his book, The Grand Chessboard, he states, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus of foreign policy issues except in the circumstance of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. Even the Reich Fuhrer of the Nazi party, Hermann Göring, sums up this game of supply and demand perfectly when he stated the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. It also works the same in every individual psyche. Just remember that the false ego has only one desire, to become greater and more powerful than the true self. This illness causes us to believe that we are separate from nature. This is why we see such a rise in the dependency of technology. This is why we see such little stewardship for the earth and the environment. And this is why we see bigotry, racism, sexism, and every other form of discrimination possible that leads to crime, violence, wars, and eventually, the global destruction of the organism. This endless state of fear, confusion, and segregation our world seems to live in is a symptom of the false ego creating a false threat.
Many of the United States presidents have blood relations with each other. The Bush lineage has blood ties to a great number of former presidents. George Washington, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, Grover Cleveland, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and Gerald Ford. Michael Tassarian points out in his work that Bush is closely related to every European monarch on and off the throne and has kinship with every member of Britain's royal family. Bush's family tree can be documented as far back as the early 15th century. He has a direct descent from Henry III and from Henry VIII's sister Mary Tudor. He is also descended from Charles II of England. And we also find that George W. Bush is a direct descendant of Godfrey de Bullion. Godfrey was the first king of Jerusalem after he recaptured it from the Saracens, which was the name for the Islamic faith during the Middle Ages. It is interesting to note that the current occupation of the United States in the Middle East was re-established by the same family, George Bush Sr. in 1991 and again by George Bush Jr. in 2003. George Bush Jr. is then found to be a cousin to both opposing candidates of his two terms in office, Al Gore and John Kerry. Democratic President Barack Obama also has blood ties with George W. Bush, as well as Gerald Ford, Lyndon Johnson, Harry Truman, James Madison, and the British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill. On the opposing side of the 2008 presidential ballot, John McCain is descended from Robert the Bruce, King William I of Scotland, and also Godfrey de Bullion. One probably one of the most interesting facets of the bloodline relations is the fact that the whole British royal family has descent from the Muslim prophet Muhammad through the Arab kings of Seville. This bloodline was passed through the kings of Portugal, Castile, and eventually down to King Edward IV. This is a very, very different story from what yeah, you hear the media pumping out every day, being this idea of lineal superiority. It's completely debunked according to the foremost authority of aristocratic lineage, Burke's Peerage. And this just goes to show that there's the true story, and then there's the manufactured illusion, the front that's given to the public. These blood ties go on and on, and are documented thoroughly through literature such as Burke's Peerage and other comparable books. The point of all of this is that we find not just the same people, but the same intent within the people who have held high positions of monarchy, dynasty, aristocracy, and democracy in the past and present, and they are all related by a physical and symbolic link. This bloodline carries the symbol of our illness. The symptoms of our psycho-spiritual illness are the wars, terrorist attacks, artificial or man-made disasters, and leader figures. As long as the people remain oblivious to their inner drives and inner nature, they will always fail to recognize why these events take place and why these figures rise to such powerful positions. The reason why we have failed for thousands of years to conquer these archetypal rulers permanently is because for thousands of years we have been fighting the symptoms of an illness and not the root cause. For every corrupt government that falls at the hands of a revolutionary oppressed people, two more will rise in its place every time. Because the root cause of a corrupt government does not exist in the individual leading that government. It exists within the psyche of every individual. Because an unaware host to a deadly parasite will do anything to avoid accepting his own incapacity for freedom. We are so bereft of sanity in this world 
that those few who simply stop projecting onto others and begin facing their own demons are seen as neurotic. An article written in the 1950s states that studies showed that individuals who had been isolated from their familiar social and cultural environment became neurotic. This shows that when those individuals had no object to identify their darker emotions with, they began to see these things in themselves, that which they refused to recognize before, and were unaware of why they appeared and how to cope. Facing our true inner self is virtually unknown in our world today. This is why no matter how many civilizations rise and fall, it is our collective consciousness that creates our governing apparatus, not individual people. and after countless attempts you would imagine that people would realize that a physical retaliation may not be the solution. Yet here we are, thousands of years later with technology that can clone DNA, vehicles that can break the sound barrier and probe the depths of space, and science that can overcome almost any sickness. Yet we still fail to take notice to the importance of thoughts and consciousness. This is the very definition of insanity and every single one of us is responsible for this psychic epidemic because we're killing the messenger and paying no attention to the message. During the 1990s, three Nobel laureates in medicine advanced research that revealed the primary function of DNA lies not in protein synthesis as widely believed for the past century, but in electromagnetic energy reception and transmission. Less than 3% of DNA's function involves protein manufacture. More than 90% functions in the realm of bioacoustic and bioelectric signaling. So why is it important to know that DNA functions in bioelectric signaling? HeartMath Institute has discovered the heart and brain maintain a continuous two-way dialogue, each influencing the other's functioning. Although it is not well known, the heart sends far more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart, and the signals the heart sends to the brain can influence perception, emotional processing, and higher cognitive functions. The heart also generates the strongest rhythmic electromagnetic field in the body, and this actually can be measured in the brain waves of people around us. We are, quite literally, an electromagnetic expression of our highest cognitive function. The behavior of electromagnetism is evident throughout the world as dualism. All matter contains a negative and positive charge, which means organisms are built upon this foundation. The natural homeostasis of any organism is a balance of both polarities. Furthermore, research on emotional energetics shows that the heart's field is a carrier of emotional information and a mediator of bioelectromagnetic communication within and outside the body. Research shows our heart's field changes distinctly as we experience different emotions. It is registered in people's brains around us and apparently is capable of affecting cells water and DNA studied in vitro. Fear. The chemical supplied by a collective parasite creates a distinct bioelectric signal given off by the host. This signal is disseminated to the organisms within our community and will grow outward through the entire organism unless it is counterbalanced by an opposing force. Dr. Fritz Allen Popp discovered that the cells in our body communicate through biophotons which are tiny particles of light that are single units of an electromagnetic field. This communication system within our body also exists between people in what's known as morphic resonance. This was known by the shamans, sages, and adepts of antiquity. These teachings were commonplace in prehistoric cultures. It wasn't by sheer chance that artistic expression and rituals were the cornerstone of every ancient civilization. 
Art was used as a personal method to exercise the shadow content of the psyche and introduce it to the conscious mind. This was very literally viewed as psychic therapy. Ritual was based around astrological dates. As we've learned, the study of the stars and planets reflect our own astropsychology. The shamans would perform rituals on astrological dates that would correlate with a circadian rhythm or a psychological cycle. These rituals kept the human participants aware of their inner self and prevented the repression of psychological content. As long as people were facing their inner demons and accepting them as their own, they were not collectively projecting them into the physical world. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. The progeny of our psychological disease began growing rapidly after a series of catastrophes forced the collective into a somatic state of fight or flight. This lowered the immunity of the population by introducing a state of immense stress. Our body becomes more susceptible to illness under stress. In this manner, humanity fell ill when entire bodies of land were swallowed up by the floodwaters. This uprooted many tribes, chiefdoms, and civilizations from their homes, and their ritual practices that were used as a conduit for psychic wellness were put on hold in order to survive the catastrophe and seek new homes. The shamans were spread to many new areas of the world. This information has been suppressed. We are made to believe that advanced civilizations such as ancient Egypt and the Mayans of Mesoamerica came about with no prior rudimentary remnants or evidence of evolving intellectual artifacts to bring them to their peak. We are meant to believe that their incredible knowledge of mathematics, astrology, agriculture, economy, polity, and architecture came out of nowhere. This leads many researchers today to the understanding that the origins of these civilizations have been suppressed. Not surprisingly, the force that has guided the suppression of this knowledge comes from the exact bloodline of the political and religious leaders stated previously. These are some of the notable book burnings and suppression of important texts in our history. Yet after all of this suppression, there are still remnants of the dispersion of elder civilizations in nearly every country. There is tremendous evidence of ancient cultures visiting North America long before the conventional belief of European colonization. Barry Fell states in his book, America B.C., there are ancient inscriptions now being reported from nearly all parts of the United States, Canada, and Latin America, written in various European and Mediterranean languages in alphabets that date from 2,500 years ago. William Commonus Beaumont wrote, the Toltec and Maya civilizations never originated on American soil, but appeared there full-blown, with a well-defined art and system of hieroglyphic writing which possesses affinities with Egyptian. It is found that there are thousands of prehistoric sites across New England and several other northern states showing inscriptions, carvings, and mounds created by Druidic mariners as far back as 800 BC. To suppress this information further, it was not only imperative for the bloodline to burn the documented texts containing true historical information, but to wipe out the cultures that derived from these ancient shamans. The most devastating genocide ever endured was and still is the annihilation of shamanic tribes. We've lost our traditional roots and don't know about ritual. The dragon dances and the ghost dances of the Native American Indians, what do you think that was all about? All the shamans of the world. When they do their rituals, they're doing that. Their work, harmonically through dances, is to strengthen the immune system of the earth. You know, but they've been all murdered. So that was why in the 17th century, exactly the same period I'm talking about, there was an all-out agenda that when you come across indigenous people, you annihilate them. Columbus was sent on his expedition along with agents of the crown to disrupt the lives of the natives and seize mineral resources. He visited every island in the Caribbean, depleting the gold and taking as many slaves of the native Taino tribe as possible. Five million natives were murdered within three years, according to Leah Trabek. Within 15 years, the Arawak tribe of 250,000 was completely wiped out. The population of the United States prior to European contact was greater than 12 million. 
Four centuries later, the count was reduced by 95% to 237,000. From 1494 to 1508, over three million people had perished from war, slavery, and the mines. Who in future generations will believe this? I myself writing this as a knowledgeable eyewitness can hardly believe it. My eyes have seen these acts so foreign to human nature, and now I tremble as I write. Another agent of the false ego bloodline was Hernando Cortez, who decimated the Aztec tribe and plundered their mineral resources. This again was the case through Cortez's second cousin, Francisco Pizarro, who conquered the Incan Empire in Peru. These atrocities are seen throughout Africa, New Zealand, New Guinea, East Timor, and are still seen today in Canada. This was a deliberate attempt to bury any surviving remnants of the ancient world and our true history. It is a naive mistake, however, to categorize and blame everything and everyone involved with politics or religion for this suppression of knowledge. It is only natural for people to crave spiritual understanding when there are so many manufactured missing links and perversions in the spiritual text today. And due to this void of spiritual wisdom, honest and moral people who are simply trying to understand their place in this world become the prime consumer market for those who wish to exploit this vulnerability. The ego is something that is um, it's insecure. It's something that is in need of of control. The ego actually is an inferior thing, but it's trying to act like it is something that is superior. Uh, and hence this schism occurs between the ego and between the unconscious or, or the self. There's a kind of a messiah complex at work here as well, I feel, that, that we project uh, the savior type I ideal on someone and we, and we expect them to save us and we're not willing ourselves to kind of deal with this and get to the root of why we perhaps feel insecure or why we feel we, we, we don't have enough power to, to run our own lives basically. If we look at the New Age movement for instance, which, which is another kind of trap in all of this, uh, where people might end up actually. They, they're looking for something so bad that they, they're, they're taking all these things that are handed to us or to, to them. Uh, but it's not really based on any real understanding, it's still kind of coming from a religious type of perspective. People are genuinely seeking something new, they're genuinely seeking a new type of, of uh, spirituality or to better themselves or to change something, but this is being hijacked. And what they actually do is that they lead you into another type of uh, you know, group mentality or new age religion, whatever it is, and, and people still are not able to kind of really break free from that and follow their own uh, journey or their own path, uh, which I think is very important in all of this. In the pre-Christian era, there were several cults of incredible power, most notably the Stellar, Solar, Saturnian, Lunar, and Mushroom cults. It is simple to see that worshippers of the Lunar Goddess comprise of the Lunar cult. The worship of Sun Gods were indicative of the Solar cults. The Saturnian cult, which consisted of Phoenicians and Canaanites, worshipped El or Eli. The biblical exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt showed that they entered Canaan and merged the lunar cult of Isis, the solar cult of Ra, and the Saturnian cult of El to form Isis, Ra, El. Israel The old Israelitish cult and mythology, the Yahweh worship, the patriarchal legends, the sojourn in Egypt, and so on, are rooted in the religion of the sacred fungus developed from the underlying fertility philosophy of the ancient Near East. The Jewish mitre, Muslim turbans, and military berets are derivations of the symbol of the mushroom cult. One of the first and most prominent, however, was the stellar cult. And a number of these ancient cults were created for shamanic purposes and earthly stewardship. Yet some were taken over with different intentions. Just as you would imagine in any establishment of power, smaller cults formed within the main cults to worship individual deities. The cult of Mithras and the cult of Dionysus are two examples. 
you still today can see the Mithraic or Phrygian cap on the symbol of the ceded liberty dollar, the coat of arms of many countries, the reverse side of the flag of Paraguay, the seal of the United States Senate, and even involved in the solar cult holiday that we now call Christmas. In the cult of Dionysus, many festivals were celebrated such as the Greater Dionysia, celebrated in Athens around the spring equinox. The foremost event in this festival was the Thymelic Contest in which poets, musicians, and entertainers performed in an open-air theater. Musicians did not have to pay taxes and members of the Artists Guild did not have to participate in military affairs. The cult of Dionysus is still alive to this day as the entertainment industry. These cults still exist in many important positions of power throughout the entire civilized world. Yet the most important function of these groups is to manufacture the consent and complicity of the people. The conscious mind is the creative mind. It's the one that has your personal identity into it. It does the, the, the real thinking. And then there's a subconscious mind. Well, there's no entity in it. The subconscious mind is the equivalent of a tape player. It records behaviors, and then at the push of a button, plays a behavior. It's automatic. It's a very convenient thing, because then we don't have to relearn all the time. Once you know it, you can make a pattern. The problem is that the basic patterns of belief and behavior that are programmed in the subconscious mind came from our teachers, primarily our parents, our family, and our community. So most people don't even understand how easily we're influenced by our environment. Every person that we encounter, every single situation that we're faced with, every little word that's said on television may not seem too influential to our, to our conscious minds, but your unconscious is designed specifically to let every environmental signal influence you without your awareness. So the question is, are we leading conscious or unconscious lives? And now neuroscience has told us in the unfolding of our lives, only 5% of our life is controlled by our conscious mind and 95% of the time controlled by the subconscious with programs from other people that were installed in there. And the problem is, it means when those programs are playing, we don't see them. And the skeptics will sit there and say, consciousness, archetypes, astrology? No, no, no. We, we create things with our hands, not our minds. Archetypes aren't physical. They can't influence me. But when you think of the fact that we're only conscious of this small little fraction of our behavior, what we don't realize is that entire countries, entire civilizations that think they're free and independent, but are unconsciously too afraid to be free and independent, they will beg to be governed. And if they can't do it themselves, who do you think will consciously or unconsciously take that responsibility? It usually ends up being that strong, masculine, animus archetypal figure. When we think we're in danger, we're not looking for our mother to nurture us. We want our father to protect us. And right on cue with the age of fear, this age of catastrophe, the age of this parasite, we see masculine domination. And one of the primary conduits for giving our responsibility and our conscious energy away is money. We surely don't want to admit that our dependency on money is flawed because that would imply that the fault is our own. And God forbid we take responsibility for our lives, so we blame the money. This is the cornerstone of the entire illusion being built around us by the false ego. Money is said to be the root of all evil, yet it cannot be evil because money is only a symbol. Symbols carry only the faith and spirit of the observer. This means that the symbol of paper money evokes and surfaces the evil intentions and inherent flaw of our false ego. Money only exists because we agree to accept it as valuable. And to further illustrate our incapacity for freedom, we've given the control of our faith-based money to a private corporation instead of the federal government. There is no law stating that we have to use Federal Reserve notes as currency. We choose to because we fear the alternative. Independence.
But it's not even really about money, it's about energy, because money is simply this material thing that allows billions of people to crave just one thing and put their energy into the same thing. It's not the plasma TV or the house or the lifestyle or the job or the significant other or the status that we're really after because we know that we're empty. These people feel sadness and loneliness and void just like anybody else and they either want to fill that void with materialism because they think that that'll make them feel better or they want to sedate the void feeling with material possessions. So it all comes back to this feeling of having to put our dependency into an external source, something that we have absolutely no control over. What we're seeing right now is with all the competition of each other destroying each other, wars, competing for material existence, raping the planet and tearing it apart to get some pieces of it to hold in your hands and say you won the game. Every one of those moves is destructive, not just of the planet, but of human civilization. Because human civilization will thrive with cooperation and will die with competition. And if you operate from these truths, then you end up with the extinction that lies before us. You see, we all have demons, so to speak. We all have inner demons in our lives, but we expect to see devilish monsters or dark apparitions when you think of a demon, kind of like what you'd see in the cinema. But our demons are really the people in our everyday lives, the people that we argue with, the people that we envy or hate, uh, the ones we physically or emotionally harm in some way, shape, or form. And it's not because we envy or hate qualities in these specific people as much as we hate the fact that they remind us of ourselves. They reflect qualities about ourselves that we wish we had more of or that we wish we didn't have at all. So what do we do? We alleviate that pain, not by fixing or fighting our own demons, but by harming the people that remind us of our demons, by harming the people that remind us of the things that we don't like about ourselves. And when we become frustrated that we're not in control of our emotions because we don't really know what's affecting our emotions, we take it out on others. We take it out on absolutely anything else that can show us or act as a catalyst for our hatred and so we do the same thing to animals. Animals are perfect because they can't defend themselves. And it's a perfect catalyst for our inner aggression, our confusion, our hatred. Just take it out on something absolutely helpless. Just imagine how unconscious a person has to be of his or her actions to torture or mutilate or brutalize any living thing. goes down and uh, he'll be here and we can ouch come on oh, bit you look at his tail is it pounding with the tips maybe he's a big yeah. guy that's, that's a real think of the lack of compassion you must have towards life in general to be able to feel no semblance of sympathy towards entire populations let alone just individuals or individual animals entire populations of a species that are bred specifically for the purpose of commodity but I'll tell you what's even more dangerous is not so much the people carrying out this cruelty because that's already been established. That form of hatred and cruelty has already been established and it's already known. What I'm really worried about is the people who are against inhumanity, the people who are against animal cruelty and feel self-righteous enough to think that it's justified to inflict harm or even wish harm on these people. Because those are the people who take unconscious cruel behavior to a whole new level of conscious cruel behavior that's perfectly acceptable in their minds because they feel that it's their job to bring other people to justice like they're an authority figure of some sort those are the people who will have a much harder time figuring out why they harbor so much inner hatred and resentment they don't seem to realize that it's just another form of the same exact hatred so to keep from facing 
our inner demons consistently, what do we do? When we begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, maybe it's not all right to inflict harm on any other living thing, then the ego has to come up with a more esoteric form of cruelty to trick us into displaying the same form of self-hatred, the same indignant attitude, but just in another way and towards another group of people. But the emptiness will always find a way back in and people will always start to feel restless again no matter how many times they transfer blame to yet another person or yet another group. We need chaos in our lives. We crave destruction. We beg for catastrophe. Because if we don't have these things to act as a form of exorcism or a catalyst for us, we start to notice these things in ourselves and that's what we don't want. You see, we can deal with wars. We can deal with terrorism, we can deal with stock market collapse and economic collapse, we can deal with these things, but once we start to notice this chaos within ourselves, that's what we're really afraid of. We'll take a million September 11ths over one moment of true insight towards our self-hate. And you know, the most interesting part of all of this is we encounter things every day, every single day that we either accept with open arms or that we reject violently. The interesting part is not really what we're accepting or rejecting as much as what it is inside us that makes us feel compelled to a certain thing or repelled from a certain thing. There's this fundamental dual behavior of muscular strength or weakness attraction or repulsion. And what's interesting about this is when you realize that consciousness, awareness, that intangible essence that animates all matter into what we see around us as life, that is where you will find the origin of this dual behavior. It's been explained as the inhalation and exhalation of Brahma, the contraction and the expansion of Araman and Lucifer in an anthroposophical setting the active and the passive qualities in electricity, the masculine and feminine qualities, yin and yang, existence and nothingness. These are all ways to explain the same behavioral process that begins with awareness, it begins with consciousness. And if you get rid of all the images and concepts in our minds of these sayings in your head and just try to feel the difference between the two polarities, you'll begin to notice that all of the different scenarios and possibilities that are playing out in the world all spawn from this common origin. You'll have a million people telling you why the Bible is supposedly the Word of God and that you should follow it word for word. And then you'll have another million claiming that it's a form of mind control and not to believe any of it. Everybody will tell you to beware of this or watch out for that. This is good information. This is bad information. And I just have to wonder, what makes anyone an authority figure enough to say that something is true or false? And why are you denying or accepting anything based on the suggestion of another person? Why aren't you making that decision for yourself? Information is information. There's no such thing as good or bad information. It's all what you do with it. I say let everything be your Bible. Give every piece of information, every person, every event or scenario or situation an honest and open mind because then it's your responsibility to respond to it in the way that you choose. Not following the herd, not following convention, it's your responsibility. And that's the point when, no matter how many people tell you you're wrong or right, you're not dependent upon their approval. If we at least question our own actions, question our own thought process, and make a conscious decision to what we feel is right every single day, that's what I believe to be divinity. That's true shamanism, and that, to me, is what it really feels like to be alive. In this conscious, living universe, there are no laws of nature, just habits. There is nothing external to the universe to enforce a law upon it. The illusion of a fixed law of nature is only the result of there being no need for that habit to be broken. When habits need to be broken to ensure the survival of the organism, we see this event in nature and call it evolution. The collective mind shapes our evolution. 
And a great example of this is the experiment done by John Cairns in 1988. His team put lactose intolerant cells in an environment with only lactose for food. Under a law of nature, every one of these lactose intolerant cells would have died. But surprisingly, they all survived. Every one of them understood the problem that they were facing and replaced the defective lactase enzyme with a functioning one to utilize lactose for food. If a cell has the ability to decide how and when to evolve because it's facing extinction, than anything can. The existing beliefs are that a human body is a biochemical machine controlled by genes and therefore the behavior, emotions and character of our biology, our health, our lives are controlled by genes which we don't control. So this is what we taught people. You're a victim, genes control your life, you didn't pick them, you can't change them, the genes you end up with program what's going to happen. My experiments on stem cells, which I started in 1967, I'd isolate one stem cell, put it in a petri dish, and then it would divide every 10 hours. So I took all the cells, split them up into three groups, and then just put them in three petri dishes. And then I changed the growth medium, the constituents of the environment, in each of the three dishes. In one dish, the cells form bone. The second dish, they form muscle. and the third dish, they form fat cells. What controlled the fate of a cell? And the first thing you have to say is, well, wait, they were all genetically identical when they were put in a dish. So obviously the genes didn't control it because they all had the same genes. What was different was the environment. And all of a sudden in my career, it said, oh my gosh, here I am teaching genes control life and the cells are telling me genes respond to life. And since you can control the response, you can control your life. It's how you read the environment, how your mind perceives the environment. And if you understand this, then you could lead yourself to the most wonderful expression on this planet to be fully alive and fully healthy by just how you respond to the world. In the face of financial collapse across the world, political and religious wars raging tirelessly, and an ever-growing feeling of being lost and void of meaning, there is a great amount of energy being pushed to the surface of the collective mind. Evolution does not come about gradually. It happens in spurts and fits and comes about due to a tremendous need for the organism to survive. We are now at a point in history where we will choose. We will choose to become sovereign or remain dependent, to face our true self or continue fighting a ghost, to become well or allow this disease to grow, to live, or to die. The choice is yours. <laughs>